Okay, everyone. So last week we looked at where does famine and hunger occur and what are the causes. And this week we're actually looking at the consequences of hunger and famine. So specifically looking at the nutritional health of a person. So we know that food shortages occur where the supply in a region cannot provide enough energy and nutrients for the population but it's not just enough um, or is easily mistaken as not just the production problem, so not having enough crops, but also um, if we're importing more food than, uh, sorry, exporting more food than importing, you can also create a food shortage in that way as well. So a food shortage, as, as I just said, can be created when you have an, uh, an export or an increase in export, that means that there isn't enough food for the locals. So the Great Hunger of Ireland in 9, 1845 to 1847 and the, the famine in Bengal, which is in 1944, were actually more due to political um, decisions by Britain to export locally produced grain supplies without compensating imports, um, which resulted in a production shortfall for the local communities. So there are a bunch of ways uh, or nutritional consequences um, for food shortages. So uh, when we talk about food, we do also talk about water as well. So safe drinking water is really important. Without that, you don't have adequate sanitation or good hygiene, and that can result in either dehydration of a community or diarrhea, which is um, because of the waterborne illnesses. So. If we have a look at our waterborne illnesses, the main ones that um, countries, particularly third world countries, um, have to deal with is typhoid and cholera. So typhoid is ingested water that is contaminated with the feces of someone that is infected with typhoid and can cause headache, fever, abdominal pain, weakness, confusion and diarrhea. So this will then incapac incapacitate a person, meaning that they can't work, which means they can't earn money, which means they can't buy food, and therefore they even slump further into a cycle of hunger and, f and malnutrition. So cholera is the other waterborne disease, and that's drinking water that's been contaminated with bacteria, which is a bit different. Um, and some of the symptoms include diarrhea, dehydration, weakness, collapse, and dysentery. So again, another poverty cycle that we're seeing here, or hunger cycle, um, which keep people sick, um, and therefore they can't provide for themselves or their family. So in terms to try and prevent the formation or spreading of waterborne illnesses and diseases, trying to control the quality of the water is really important. So preventing contamination, so uh, making sure that you don't mix your sewage with your fresh water, separating bath and drinking um, facilities so that you're not getting contamination of feces into water that you're supposed to drink, controlling insect and breeding grounds for infestation as well, and also drinking or boiling drinking water. Now this last one may not be applicable if you live in a third world country that doesn't have access to electricity, so it really does depend on the types of resources that are available as to how you can prevent a waterborne disease. Now there are a whole series of deficiency diseases. Now I am going to go through these quickly because we have actually talked about these and we talked about micronutrients. So hopefully it should, um, some of these should sound pretty familiar to you by now. Around the world, 7.6 million children under five die each year from preventable illness. In nearly a third of cases, the root cause of death is hunger. It's not just starvation. Deprived of the essential minerals and vitamins they need, children are left so weakened that they can't fight off diseases, turning ordinary childhood illnesses into killers. For millions of children every year, hunger is a death sentence. When we asked the mother what happened to the child, she said the child was sick for, for four days. What is making me cry today? But even for the children that survive, hunger has a lasting legacy. Not getting enough food, or depending on food that isn't nutritious, leads to malnutrition. A child won't develop physically. They're shorter and weaker. 
Their brain won't fully develop. They struggle at school. Their life chances suffer. The effects are often permanent. For millions of children, hunger is a life sentence. The world has enough food for everyone, but not everyone has enough food. It's unfair, unjust, and entirely preventable. Helping mothers breastfeed their babies could save 1.4 million lives every year. Fortifying meals and providing essential minerals and vitamins would boost childhood development and save hundreds of thousands of children. Just giving malnourished children vitamin A could save nearly half a million young lives. Giving mothers food vouchers and money in times of need tackles malnutrition and sustains local markets. Simple things save lives and we'll do whatever it takes to turn your support into life-saving change. Your money tips the balance, helping us save lives and transform futures. Your voice gives weight to our campaign, forcing our leaders and governments to act. If the world fails to meet this challenge, then we'll never be able to give children a life free from hunger. Whenever world leaders meet, let's put hunger at the top of their to-do list. All right, so some of the macronutrient deficiency diseases include Koshiokor disease, which is protein deficiency. Now, you are going to have to remember how to pronounce that one. I know it's a bit of a, t a tongue twister, um, and you need to know roughly how to spell it as well. Um, so you might want to write it out 20 times so you remember. Uh, so it does affect children one to five years old. Um, it's usually a result of insufficient protein consumption, but can also be insufficient calorie intake as well, but it is a protein deficiency. Um, a whole bunch of symptoms, including ap apathy, um, so lack of interest, uh, retention of fluid, so edema, which is um, what this little boy is suffering from here, muscle wasting, uh, because there's no protein to make uh, muscles, descended abdomen as well, and fatty liver. So if there is a long-term koshiokor um, in a child, it can actually impact on their physical and mental development and in severe cases can actually lead to death. So some of the dietary changes that you would want to implement um, into a child so that they don't suffer um, from koshiokor is uh, to include foods like fish, legumes, eggs, uh, milk as well. Um, you've got milk and milk products which are rich sources of protein. So some children that are suffering from koshiokor may actually be lactose intolerant. So you have to think of dairy-free um, protein sources. So it might be, or you may have to give them lactase enzyme supplements like lactase that actually help them to digest dairy products that are high in protein. So marasmus is another deficiency and this one is a combination of both protein and energy deficiency. Uh, and usually the main cause is discontinuation of breastfeeding in young children um, and they appear skeletally thin like this young child here. Um, they have prominent ribs, sunken eyes, little to no fat and they look quite aged as well and in extreme cases can actually lead to koshiokor as well. So obviously some of the dietary changes for marasmus is to introduce nutritionally dense foods um, including foods that have enough calories and protein to sustain the individual because we are looking at protein and calorie or energy deficiency. So um, vitamins and minerals might need to be taken via supplementation. So often when we look at short-term and long-term solutions, which is the topic next week, we will actually look at um, energy dense bars that are given as a short term solution along with supplements as well. So peanut butter is a really energy dense um, example of foods that will be given to people or communities that are suffering from marasmus as well as supplements and then long term solutions will be to actually help them to grow and incorporate their own crops. But I'm more on that next week. So then we get into different types of vitamin deficiencies. So we've got zero Xerophthalmalia, which is vitamin A deficiency. I would just call it vitamin A deficiency. Uh, what the symptoms are, again, I'm not going to go through these in incredible detail because you should already know most of them. 
We've um, so obviously including foods that are rich in vitamin A, like carrots and sweet potato. Um, there are there is actually an example in East Africa where they um, use bananas. So what scientists have actually done um, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is to actually genetically modify bananas that are high in vitamin A, and then given them to the communities to grow. So um, and then those communities, because banana is a staple it's now rich in vitamin A um, and they will incorporate it into their food to help uh, stop um, vitamin A deficiency. So anemia is another deficiency that we all are pretty f uh, familiar with. There's iron deficiency anemia or folate deficiency anemia or B12 deficiency anemia. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through these again because you should be pretty familiar with them. Uh, so. Um, it is one of the most prevalent malnutrition uh, deficiencies worldwide. So 2 billion people actually suffer from um, anemia. And then symptoms include tiredness, paleness, loss of appetite, premature births, if they are a severe sufferer and pregnant at the time, um, and impedes cognitive development as well. If you were to stop iron deficiency, there would be an increased national rise in productivity levels by about 20%, which is why we should care about trying to eliminate anemia. So obviously increase your iron intake and improve the nutritional status of your foods as well. So making sure you prevent and control other deficiencies like vitamin B12, folate or vitamin A. So iodine deficiency, is a goiter, which we've already talked about before. Some symptoms include deaf, mute, or um, retarded babies if the mother is a sufferer, brain damage in infants as well. Um, one of the ways to increase um, iodine is to fortify it in the diet, so iodized cooking salt, or to fortify uh, bread, for example, that includes um, iodine or other. Um, micronutrients. Pellagra, which is your B3 deficiency, includes dermatitis, diarrhea and dementia and it's by, controlled by improving the working conditions of poor people and it's just about getting protein rich foods including eggs, meat and peanuts. Berry berry, which is B1 or thiamine deficiency, is a digestive disorder that causes nausea, vomiting, constipation, and diarrhea. It is most common in Far East Asia, where um, the staple, which is white rice, lacks thiamine. So if you're not consuming it, then obviously you're going to get a deficiency. Um, and consuming foods, obviously, that are high in thiamine will help prevent that deficiency from occurring. So zinc deficiency um, attributes to growth failure and weakened immunity in young children. So vitamin C deficiency does not weaken your immunity system. Zinc, however, does. So uh, you have a higher risk of diarrhea and pneumonia if you have a zinc deficiency and can cause koshiokor or dermatitis as well. So zinc supplementation, food fortification and crop nutrition is important. So obviously trying to incorporate zinc rich foods where possible into your diet. And if those foods don't exist in your local community, that's where supplementation can occur or is appropriate. So lastly, we're going to look at rickets, which is your vitamin D deficiency. Now rickets are in association with calcium and phosphorus. So all three micronutrients need to be consumed in adequate amounts to make sure that all three are being um, appropriately absorbed. So children with darker skin tend to be at greater risk because the UV does not penetrate their skin. Therefore, vitamin D is not synthesized. So some symptoms and Consequences of that include deformed legs, broken or easily broken bones and dental problems. So increasing your sun exposure or vitamin D supplementation. So often a lot of people will take vitamin D supplements in winter because they're not getting the same amount of um, sunlight that they would in summer. Uh, and increasing vitamin D rich foods like oily fish, egg yolk or dairy fats if you can. So the last one is vitamin C, which has nothing to do really with your immune system. It does result in poor wound healing, 
but also bleeding gums, bruising, and tenderness of joints and muscles. Um, obviously, increasing your citrus fruits is going to increase your vitamin C deficiency as well.